Vintage Magic. Game. Collect. Invest. Hey everyone, Sam here from Kitchen Table Magic, and I'm here with Brian Weissman. Brian, how's it going? Hey, it's going great. And we are about to do some commentary on a match. This is uh, LurkerCon 4, the semifinals, at Grand Prix Seattle that was hosted by Daniel Chang of Vintage Magic. Uh, this is an old school event, which uh, means that it was using the card sets that were available pretty much through the middle of 1994. So uh, for this particular event, which used Eternal Central Rules, we were using up through Fallen Empires with the uh, one distinction that makes it, the format distinct from what's played in Europe. We had the ability to use four strip lines versus one, which is a rather controversial subject. But the decks that uh, were legal in this format could use up to four strip lines. And that's certainly the deck that I'm using here. Brian, tell us what deck are you using? All right, well, I, as most people would probably expect, I have to use my namesake deck, the deck, mm -hmm. a five color control deck that is devoted to a relatively singular and direct game plan of establishing dominance and card advantage exhausting the opponent of resources both in hand and on the board and eventually finishing them with a single finisher. In this case, I have a single copy of Shiv and Dragon in my deck. And my opponent, uh, Eric from Bellingham, Washington, is playing not a carbon copy, but a very similar design. Uh, his deck diverges from mine in that it's completely creatureless. And like many people who run this archetype in current old school, it's kind of funny to call it modern old school, and I don't want to confuse the terms, but uh, current old school, a lot of people opt to run four copies of the card, Mishra's Factory as a finisher. And and uh, it's proven to be a very effective strategy. I've decided not to go in that direction, at least for this tournament, believing that uh, using the card Moat gives me a pretty he uh, hefty advantage against not only other Mishra's Factory users, but against aggro decks in general. And of course, you can't use Moat if you're planning to finish the game with Mishra's Factories because those two things interfere with each other. So, all right, so you can see that Eric is keeping his hand right here. He leads off with just the Tundra. And I draw a Black Lotus right off the bat. I play a Volcanic Island. I've got, I think, three other lands in my hand, and I decide to play Black Lotus. And the reason I'm playing Black Lotus, of course, is just to represent counter magic against something that he may do. Mm -hmm. So getting a gander at Eric's hand. So looking at Eric's hand, it's no wonder that he actually kept. You can see he's got, he started, I think, probably with a Tundra and a City of Brass in his hand. There's a card that's obfuscated right now, which is Demonic Tutor behind Counterspell, but he has nearly a perfect hand and at the very bottom of his hand lurking below the edge of that jam day tome is my ultimate nemesis in the format library of alexandria the very specific reason why i pointed out you want to play second because not only does it give you a free card off library of alexandria it gives you the maximum opportunity to draw a library of alexandria because you go one card further into your deck and of course if your opponent plays an opposing library of alexandria it gets you one card closer to a strip mine to deal with it the card is so oppressive and powerful and makes the matches so lopsided that Literally, it can, the entire game can come down to hinging on that one particular card. And in this particular game, uh, Eric started with Library of Alexander in his hand. Now, it's interesting that he didn't play it on turn one. And my estimation, if, I were to, if he were here and commenting on his own thought process through the game, I would have expected that the reason why he did that was because he started the game with Counterspell in his hand. He wanted to play two blue mana sources before he played the library in order to contain something that I might be doing. It's an insurance policy. It's not ridiculous at all. I think it's actually a pretty, a pretty sound and wise play. It has the additional benefit, of course, of potentially baiting strip mines from your opponent. In a four strip mine format, it's quite likely almost half the time someone's going to start with a strip mine in their hand, or at least a way to get a strip mine, either through Demonic Tutor or through Ancestor Recall. There's a wide range of ways that they can have access to strip mine. Because of that, if you just throw the library out at the beginning of the game, that card is so powerful and can win the game on the spot that you're effectively gambling that they don't have a strip mine. If you play some non-strip mine lands at the beginning, an opponent who is maybe has one or two strip mines in their hand will see an opportunity, oh, I'm gonna go and land destroy this guy and he's not gonna be able to play the game. In fact, there's an impression in old school format that strip mine is so powerful that it prevents people from playing games of magic against you. That's not my impression at all because the decks tend to run so much mana. So I think that that's actually a bit of a uh, misconception about the format. But people who do open the game with multiple strip mines tend to not resist using them on all the lands that they see. And if you start the game with library and a few other lands, you can bait their strip mines first, get them to expend their strip mines on your, on your colored mana, then you play the library and now they're looking at one or two outs in their whole deck to deal with it and the game is over at that point. And your suspicion about him wanting to keep two blue mana open for that counterspell was correct now that you're looking at his hand. Yeah, I, I think that, I, I believe that based on what actually happens, I don't, at the risk of spoilers, but based on what happens in game two and his, the way that he plays a similar situation in game two, my suspicion is, is that the only reason he played the Library of Alexandria here 
that he held it was not because he was hoping to bait strip mines, but it was because he started the game with Counterspell and he was just using it as insurance. So you can see Eric thinking about what to do. He's just played his second blue source. I just play a Volcanic Island. My hand is currently just a bunch of reactive cards, so I can't do anything. So now we go to his next turn, and he looks at it, and he finally decides to play Library of Alexandria. It is my worst fear recognized. Okay, so this marks a true turning point in this game. This card is, and honestly, I kind of had this sense in my head based on his body language. I've played so many games of old school that I kind of get this feeling. I don't know what it is. It's, you know, a sixth sense poker players talk about this a lot of the time, but when you're, when you're so steeped in something, when you have so much experience with it, you kind of get an intuition often in your opponent's body language, the way that they're moving their hands. I kind of felt like he had library in his hand and that he may have actually been waiting for it. And I'm positive that had I had a strip mine in my hand, which unfortunately I don't, but if I had a strip mine, I definitely would not have used it. I would have waited. I would have waited to see if in fact he did have library. So when he plays the library of Alexander and you notice he's got six cards in his hand because he elected to go first, he doesn't have the ability to immediately draw a card in his hand. Now this is a critical point in the game. If he had gone second, there would have been nothing I could have done to stop him from drawing from library. There would have been nothing I could have done to get him off of the library of Alexandria because he would just draw a card on my turn, he'd be up to eight. Even if I am able to force a card out of his hand by playing something that he has to counter, he's still at seven. He untaps, he draws an eighth card, plays another land. We're just back in the same hole. And that cycle repeats endlessly until I'm dead. So when he plays Library of Alexander, of course, my heart just sinks. I know that I have no strip mines in hand. And I know that unless the top card of my deck is a strip mine, or maybe two cards down, the game's gonna run out of control very, very quickly and it's gonna snowball and I'm gonna lose. So going back to my turn, of course, I'm presented with one choice and I have the card Brain Geyser in my hand. And Brain Geyser plus Black Lotus and another land that I play is gonna be a geyser for a total of four cards. And my hope is, is that Eric will have, not only have a counterspell in hand, but he will decide to elect to actually counterspell the Brain Geyser. That's all I can hope for. I mean, I guess, I guess ideally, maybe he would let the Brain Geyser resolve. And in those four cards, I would draw a strip mine, which would allow me to deal with the library. But the reason I'm making this play, which is obviously premature because both Brain Geyser and Black Lotus are very, very important cards to have in the matchup. I'm simply gonna make this play because I'm gonna force my opponent to use a card from his hand. That'll drop his hand size down to five. And if he doesn't have the discipline to draw a card and simply pass the turn without playing anything, therefore bringing his hand size back up to six, I may actually be able to keep him off the library long enough to draw into a strip mine or a demonic tutor or some way to get one and destroy the land before he can kill me with it. So that's what you'll see me do as soon as the play resumes. So here you see me thinking about it and I draw another card that's not a strip man and so I know I have to go for the play that I just described, which is just a, that's an underground sea, I think. Brain Geyser comes to the front and really without hesitation, sack the Lotus for three, tap out and that's a Brain Geyser for four. In the vain hope that he doesn't counter it, and he does. Okay, so that drops Eric's hand size down to five. I have a momentary reprieve. And he snap counters it. Snap counters it in a second, which I agree with. So then it goes back to his turn, and I'm thinking, all right, well, if he's savvy, he's just gonna do nothing. And then he plays a pearl and casts Demonic Tutor here. And I'm thinking, oh, great. So that was, not only did I just have my geyser and my lotus countered, not only does he have a uh, Demonic Tutor, but he has one blue mana available to retrieve Ancestral Recall, which of course what is what he gets. So his hand size goes from five on my turn up to six. He plays the Pearl, it's down to five. He casts Demonic Tutor, it's still at five. Now he Ancestrals off that untapped Tundra. That takes him up to seven. That activates Library of Alexander again. I fall into the same hole and I'm basically just dead on the spot here. But for some reason that I, I cannot ascertain, he decides not to Ancestral Recall. He just gets the card in his hand and passes the turn back to me. So he doesn't get active library and he allows me to untap three blue mana sources, at which point I can represent counter magic and he can't just throw the ancestral in my counter magic, especially after he's tutored for it. Because if I do have a counter spell for it, either in the form of regular counter spell or a red elemental blast, then he will no longer be able to use library at all. So he tutors for ancestral recall, fingers it, and passes the turn back to me. You see, I have four mana untapped. So now he just can't cast the Ancestral Recall, of course. Now he draws another amazing card. I mean, his hand is just stacked. He has Felwar Stone, Soul Ring, City of Brass, Jam Day Tome, and a Wheel of Fortune, which is an odd choice, but uh, not the worst. And again, all he has to do to win the game here, I clearly don't have a strip mine in my hand. All he has to do is just say pass. He doesn't have to play anything. 
So he plays a Sol Ring, and at the end of his turn, I elect, even though these are very precious, I decide to disenchant the Sol Ring. I don't know if he has any more mana in his hand. I'm doing this, again, maybe to draw out another counterspell to keep him further off the library. And I'm still in my head thinking, why hasn't he cast the Ancestral Recall? Why didn't he play at the turn that he tutored? Because he clearly must have done that. And so I start to think maybe he doesn't actually have Ancestor Recall in his hand. Maybe he got Mind Twist, which means that destroying his mana is more important. So I'm just doing nothing. I'm still just drawing reactive cards. He plays another land instead of passing. So he still hasn't drawn a single card off Library of Alexandria yet. And we're now, what, six turns into the game, right? One of those turns he passes, he's now drawn five or six extra cards off Library. He plays a Felwar Stone. We're still waiting around. I draw. I'm just hoping. And finally, my seventh draw step, I think, in the game, or maybe sixth draw step, finally delivers a strip mine. But at this point, he's still not representing, he's not representing any way to uh, draw cards with the library. I don't even actually have to use the strip mine. I can wait. So we're back on Eric's turn here. Now, is there a reason why you didn't play Shivan Dragon there? I know for sure he's playing a near carbon copy of my deck. Uh, the mana bases are a little bit different, but most of the relevant spells are the same. The standard deck design is four copies of the card Swords to Plowshares, which is the all-purpose white best removal spell, really best removal spell ever printed in Magic, certainly the best spot removal spell ever printed. And uh, it's an automatic four of in pretty much every single control deck. It's good even against other control decks because of how many people are playing with four copies of Mishra's Factory. And because Disenchants are so important to destroy the card advantage artifacts, you don't have to be using Disenchants on Amisha's Factory. So the Swords of Plowshares give you a second layer of defense against that. The Shivan Dragon is my sole finisher outside of Brain Geyser. And because of that, it's far too precious for me to just offer it up to the gods. It's, it's simply just gambling that he doesn't have a Swords in hand. There's a very, very rare chance that I might play the Shivan and he just has nothing. And it goes the distance. And if in a completely desperate situation, I might actually elect to take that play, but it's far too precious of a resource. It's not, there's no intention to play the dragon early in the game at all, under any circumstances, really against any deck, unless it's desperation. So against another control deck, he almost certainly has a Swords of Plowshares in his hand. And I believe he, he will be holding at least one copy of Swords of Plowshares this entire game. So the Shivan would have just been dead on arrival. There's no on earth I'm gonna play it and fight a counter war. It just makes no sense. So that's why I'm not playing it. All right, so looking at my hand, you can see I've got a Swords. I play an 8th Mana Source. My entire hand is just slow, reactive stuff. Moat, more Swords Splashers. I believe I have a second copy of Disenchant. But I'm really just sitting here waiting for the uh, the shoe to fall. What was what did he tutor for? So then he plays Jam de Tome here, which is really interesting. And I'm going to pause again here to discuss my line of play here. So it goes back to my turn. And on my turn, he's left only two blue Mana Sources in play. I do have a Disenchant in my hand, and he's left his Library of Alexandria untapped. Now, because so much time has passed, we're now, I don't know how many turns past the Demonic Tutor, but at least seven turns past the Demonic Tutor. I haven't seen the Ancestor Recall. He hasn't, he's made no attempt to play it. I don't think that he has it in his hand anymore. I still think he might be sitting on Mind Twist here. With that in mind, I don't consider the Library of Alexandria a threat. And therefore, obviously the Jam de Tome is a huge threat, but him having two untapped blue mana is a way to defend against the Tome. And I'm certain that if I go to destroy the library, or if I go to destroy the Gemini Tome with the Disenchant, he'll just counter it and I'll be screwed because the rest of my hand can't stop a Tome. It's a bunch of slow crap like Moat and Shivan and Swords to Plowshares, which don't affect the game. So top priority right here, even though it means that I'm surrendering my ability to deal with the Library of Alexandria, is to strip mine that City of Brass, reducing him down to a single blue mana. Uh, if he were to float mana, I could just declare my attack step to get it out of his mana pool and then disenchant the Tome and he can't defend against it. And so that's the that's what I ultimately decided to do here, even though it is taking a risk that if he has a way to get back up to seven, I'm going to be defenseless against the library. But this is basically dealing with the devil I know versus the devil that's uncertain. The Tome is definitely guaranteed to kill me. The library could be a threat, but the Tome is the immediate thing that needs to be dealt with. So that's, that's what I did. So you'll see the strip mine on the City of Brass. He thinks for a little bit, and when I see him tap and float blue here, I know exactly what's coming. And I think, God damn, why couldn't I just draw a counterspell at some point this game? I haven't drawn any counterspells or my red blast. I have six ways to stop this and none are in hand. And there's the Ancestral Recall from the Demonic Tutor. And of course, I just, I think for a second, but if, he knows that if I have a counterspell, I'm going to counterspell that in a heartbeat. I'm not, I'm going to fight over it. Because not only does it draw him three cards, but it gets him right back up in the library range. And I now disenchant the tome with my heart sinking again, knowing that that library from so many turns before is going to kill me unless I miraculously top deck another strip mine right away. And he draws a counter spell off the library. It's so brutal. Sigh. All right, so he untaps. His hand is now stacked. He's got eight cards. He draws again. 
And he has a copy artifact. Yeah, there. and he's got a copy artifact, which is a very interesting choice, actually. It's a card that I am now running in my deck, and I think that uh, the card was actually restricted back in the day uh, because people could duplicate restricted. Okay, we just actually jumped ahead, so I'm going to have to pause for one second. Okay, so uh, due to the way that the video is edited, we, uh, we missed my last turn, but I managed through pure miracle to top deck and strip my number two and deal with the Library of Alexandria after I only drew one card off of it. So, and that's why we don't see the library in yeah, play anymore. Yeah, that's why the library is mysteriously popped into his graveyard. You can see the strip mine on top of my, li uh, on top of my graveyard right there. So I did get lucky enough to draw strip mine number two and deal with the threat. But having said that, he already got to draw four extra cards between Ancestral Recall and Library of Alexandria, putting him even further ahead. And you've seen that he's just drawn a Chaos Orb, which is going to complicate the situation immensely. And you've been fighting back Library, Tome, Ancestral Recall. Yeah, pretty much all the cards that actually matter. And and it's just a general thing in old school format. No matter how much skill you accumulate at this format, you're very often, especially in the mirror matchup, you're very often at the mercy of what order the cards are drawn in. There's such a snowballing relationship between, and it often also hinges around the card Ancestor Recall. Ancestor Recall draws such a large portion of your deck that it gets you to the recursive cards in the form of Time Twister, Regrowth, Recall, ways to get the Ancestral back, and you basically just get this domino effect where you just get m way more resources than your opponent, draws you into more card draw, allows you to defend your Jam Day Tomes, destroy theirs, and it just snowballs from there into a win, which is very often how these games are decided. And we're going to return to Eric's turn now. All right, so Eric's sitting here contemplating what to do. I see him pay two mana for Chaos Orb, and I think Chaos Orb is worthy of a quick discussion here. Anybody who's followed old school format is probably aware of the presence of this card. Chaos Orb has a completely unique effect in all of Magic. It was banned, I think, eventually in 1995. But for a while, for a year and a half or so, it was a staple in pretty much every deck that existed. And uh, the original wording of the card is that you flip it onto the battlefield from a height of at least one foot. It has to turn over at least once. And there's a fair amount of debate about what turning over means. It's not a frisbee spin. It's a flip, like a somersault. Yeah, right, right, like a somersault. And I think the accepted usage of the card is that it must complete one entire revolution. So that's a 180 degree turn, which is quite easy to do no matter how you hold it. Some people say it needs to turn over completely, like, like flipping over once. Yeah, like a, a coin going from heads to heads. However, uh, there's... Um, there's some debate over that. The card has a very in another interesting, unique property, and that's that it is, as far as I know, the only artifact in all of Magic that you can disenchant in response to its activation. Normally, as you know, any artifact that's activated will put the activated ability on the stack. You can respond to it, but nothing short of a stifle effect or trick bind or something disallow or whatever will stop the card from actually going off. Chaos Orb is an exception to that because of its weird wording. It specifically checks to see if it's in play upon resolution. Because it needs to land on the object. Exactly, it's whatever it's landing on. So if you disenchant the orb or destroy it in some other manner before it resolves, you can actually counter the effect. Because it never lands. Yeah, so in a weird, in a very rare circumstance, it's possible to chaos orb your opponent's chaos orb. <laughs> you can imagine the two orbs flying through space and clashing into each other, something crazy like that. And that obviously doesn't happen. You don't curl your orb at theirs. But you can actually do that. They, res you, they activate their orb and you respond by flipping your orb on their orb. And if yours is successful, their orb is dead. So um, that's a very interesting quality of the card, but as a, as a, as a thing in general, as a tool, it's, a, it's profoundly powerful. It's basically a three mana Vindicate for any permanent that exists in this format. On top of that, you can just invest two mana and have it sit in play, waiting to kill something important. And um, of course, there's the proximity issue that's endemic to the card too. The card initially, as it was created by Richard Garfield and his playtest team, it was intended to punish your, pro your opponent for stacking all their permanents up. And you notice that Eric has a bunch of cards all stacked on top of each other. Well, the way that it's kind of currently errated in old school format is that you pick a singular target with it. And this is how we played it back in the day as well. And eventually we completely did away with the flipping entirely because everybody was so proficient at using the card that there was no reason to, uh, to bother to go through the flipping and no one really wanted to screw around with that. So what you do is you simply pay two mana and then whenever you activate it, you'd say, I declare that as a target, pay one mana and just destroy it. And everybody would just nod their head and put whatever the card was in the graveyard. In this case, in current old school, you actually have to physically flip the card still. And uh, the only difference though, is that you just pick a target. It doesn't matter where it lands as long or what it's touching, as long as it's touching the intended target and that target will be destroyed. So Eric is gonna play, not only play a Chaos Orb, but in a second you see, he's gonna cast that enchantment on it. And there he goes. So he casts Copy Artifact. This is still in the stack and I ask him, because you don't actually declare what you're copying until the card resolves. So I confirm with him that the card is in fact, that he's copying Chaos Orb. That's fairly evident because he's laying it down on top of it. 
So now I have to deal not only with this board state where my opponent has more mana than me and more cards in hand that almost certainly matter, but he's got two copies of Chaos Orb in play too, which makes the two next things that I might choose to fight over completely dead on arrival. And you basically just draw, pass it back to Eric. Eric draws. Yeah, plays a Mox Jet, nothing really going on. He passes it back to me. We're gonna sit here and just stare at each other for a little while and play lands, which is often what happens in old school. I've just got four or eight lands just sitting in a grid staring at him. You can see him, he's fingering a Mox Ruby here, I think, at the end of my turn, thinking about whether or not he wants to go and use an orb on something he eventually thinks better of it. And you're careful about looking at your opponent, because you've got your hand down on the table. Yeah, this is something that I, uh, a skill that I've just adopted as a player, and I use it in every format I play. I, you'll see a lot of people, he's doing it right there, and a lot of people who play the game will sort of fidget uncontrollably with their cards, staring at them. And uh, you're just seeing we're continuing to play draw go here. I, I draw a Jam Detome, and as powerful as the card is, I can't really just commit it to the board, because I'm going to be paying four mana committing a precious resource to the board and he's going to pay one mana to destroy it with Chaos Orb. But you notice my hand is down on the table again. Every time my opponent draws a card, I'm watching his eyes. I'm watching where his eyes go on the battlefield. I'm watching his hands. I'm doing everything I can to try to glean every bit of information about what, what, is, what is his body language saying to me. And if I'm busy, absorbed in my hand, shuffling it back and forth like a maniac, that doesn't really do any good. My, I know what's in my hand. My hand's not going to change magically between on his turn. So. I just watch him. Every time he draws, you see my eyes go to his hand, to his eyes. And you're very disciplined here. You have Jam Day Tome in your hand, but you are not going to be playing it into an open board. Yep. And so you notice right here, I'm going to pause again. So we're roughly probably a dozen turns into the game now, maybe a little bit more. And he's finally drawn one of his damage dealing sources. You'll see he just played his first Mishra's Factory. So with that in mind, I've got that moat still sitting in my hand from long ago. And I figure, okay, well, he's, he's playing this very standard version of this control deck. He's played, he's played Amisha's Factory. I'm going to try, because I, I feel like I'm in such a weak position. I have, currently I have one Counterspell in hand, which is Mana Drain, and I've actually just drawn Ancestral Recall, one of the most important cards in the deck. So as soon as you draw Ancestral Recall in this matchup, your main objective becomes, how can I get this card to resolve? What can I do to potentially bait Counter Magic out of my opponent's hand in order to get this Ancestral to resolve? Because as, as I've said before, it has this snowballing effect. You cast an Ancestral Recall, you're a lot closer to regrowth, you're a lot closer to recall. You can get it back and you can get to the card that will ultimately seal the game, which is usually the card Mind Twist. You blow your opponent's hand away with it and then you play a threat that he can't respond to and you win from there. So I've drawn the Ancestral Recall, he's played this factory, and now I figure, okay, well, even though he has two Chaos Orbs in play, this is a good time to play Moat. And I don't know how savvy of a player Eric is, I don't know what his priorities are, but I figure there's possibility that he may consider the moat a threat now that he's played a factory and he may use one of his counter spells over the moat which i want him to do because i want to try to get that ancestral recall to resolve that's my top priority so with that in mind i'm going to cast my moat and hope that he uh hope that he plays a counter spell over it and maybe hope that he at least uses a disenchant on it and even that maybe he'll use a chaos orb and i'll get one of those those orbs off the table, because there's there's no long-term prospect of winning the game probably with two Chaos Orbs just sitting there staring me in the face. And there's another way for you to be able to split his resources. Is he going to be attacking on the ground? Is he going to be getting you with a Fireball or Brain Geyser? You're really making him choose what angle of attack to get you with. Yeah, exactly. And I can sort of see what his priorities are. I mean, I can just see how much does he value the factories in this matchup. There are a lot of people, I've seen a lot of people play control decks where they really push the factory game aggressively. They're super aggressive at it. They'll fight counter magic wars over their factories. They're just trying to end the game in a hurry. And against a control deck that's running four strip mines, four disenchants, four swords, a pair of lightning bolts as well, and of course recursion and tutoring, and a chaos sword. <laughs> the prospect, and, and a single moat too, the prospect of actually winning the game with factories is very, very, very slim. And if you're using your counter spells to fight basically footsies over a factory, you're going to probably lose because you're going to exhaust your counter magic. And then when the big spells happen later in the game, the ones that actually swing the game, you're not going to have counters for those. So I'm hoping that he's... He's going to invest in the factory, which is why I'm playing Moat. I'm still looking at my hand here. I'm going to play my Ruby. Taking damage off City of Brass. And I'm going to cast this Moat here. And I'm thinking, come on, Eric, show me a counter spell. So I lay it out there. And he thinks for a little while. Thinking about how much he cares about that. Of course, I've got that factory covered, although all my white mana is tapped right now. Yeah, you can see I've got Sword Splashers, and uh, two of them, I think, in my hand at the moment. So he fiddles with his mana, and he just throws a disenchant, which I'm honestly not unhappy to see at all. I'm, I'm really happy to see him disenchant that, because that's showing to me that he actually is going to try to go with the factory beatdown plan. Those disenchants are very precious. They matter a lot, because, again, this 
This game's gonna be decided by card advantage artifacts, or most likely will be. So we're back to his turn. You see him deciding which mana he wants to invest in this. So this is a very, very interesting turn. I'm gonna pause in a second for sequencing. I'm just gonna wait. So he starts with a time walk. And even though I have a mana drain in hand, I'm not gonna fight a counter war with a time walk because there's way worse things that can happen. That mana drain is super precious. Then he plays a strip mine, which I believe is the only one in his deck. I think he's playing four factories in one strip mine. So had I been fortunate enough to draw a library early in the game, I would have punished him to death. I thought this game would have been over a long time ago, probably. Unfortunately, that's not what happened. So he sends in the factory. I don't have a bolt in hand. I take two relatively irrelevant damage. I think I'm at 17 now after that. I don't believe I've tapped the City of Brass for anything yet. And now here comes the hard part. Keep in mind, there's a time walk stacked up. And now he casts Wheel of Fortune. Okay, so this wheel presents a huge conundrum. First of all, I have to ask myself, why is he casting Wheel of Fortune? That's a really strange card to not only have in a control deck, because it's absolutely not standard. It's generally played in much more aggressive styles of decks, decks that are intended to sort of empty their hand onto the board in the form of small creatures and lightning bolts and then refill with Wheel of Fortune. So it's very strange to see it in a deck that clearly has a card advantage bent to it, as well as at least one Jam de Tome, which is all I've seen so far, but likely more. So it's a very strange card for me to see. I was very surprised to see that happen. Normally this card would be Time Twister. And I expected, I, I didn't see his entire deck, but I expected he also has that card in his deck too. The thing is, is that to me, the Wheel of Fortune signifies tremendous weakness. It seems to me that, I know that he still has, I think three more cards remaining in his hand, but they're very unlikely to be good cards. I, I reason that they're probably things like Red Removal and Swords to Plowshare, which means he's casting this Wheel of Fortune because he recognizes a good opening because he's cast Time Walk, a good opening to refill his hand with stuff that matters and make me discard stuff that I've been holding on to for the whole game. And I think I have five or six cards in my hand. And as you know, I just drew Ancestor Recall too. So it's probably the worst timing for my sake because I really want this Ancestral to resolve. And so I can actually get some cards to, to fight a war over stuff that's gonna actually affect the outcome of the game. The problem is, is that because he's cast Time Walk, I absolutely cannot let that Wheel of Fortune resolve. It is just, it's, I can't abide it under any circumstances. Reason being that he currently has, if you if you look at his mana, he's got, uh, after casting Wheel of Fortune, that's five untapped land as well as a Lotus. So it's eight mana there. There's an additional one, two, three, four, five, six additional land, 14 mana total available to him on the following turn. So that Wheel of Fortune plus Time Walk is gonna give him seven new cards plus a draw step plus who knows what else, and way more mana than I can contend with with my relatively meager resources. I do have six mana untapped, but he has a strip mine and two chaos orbs, which means that he can wipe out at least three of those mana sources. That would reduce me down to a single counter spell. And the chances of me actually surviving Time Walk and Wheel of Fortune are practically zero. So I have to figure, okay, how can I get that counter, how can I counter spell the wheel? How do I keep that from resolving? Well, the way that I start doing that of course, is by casting the Ancestral Recall I just drew and seeing what happens. So that's how I'm gonna, that's what I'm gonna do. So there's the wheel sitting on the stack and keep in mind there is a time walk turn stacked up. So I tap an island and I cast Ancestral Recall. And here I think he makes a huge mistake, honestly. I think this is a tremendous mistake of his. He decides to counterspell the Ancestral Recall. I think this is a, a terrible mistake. He has a time walk turn coming. So from his perspective, all that matters is that that wheel resolves. He should let me Ancestral and assume that I only have one counterspell to fight over the wheel. He should be using that counterspell to protect the Wheel of Fortune. So I've got Mana Drain in my hand, right? And the question is here, this is, this is probably the hardest decision that I faced in the entire game. And it's funny because the video is showing me, the video is showing me just setting my Ancestral Recall into the graveyard in response to the counterspell on it. But truth be told, something like six or seven minutes went by. That's right, this is edited down. Yeah, this is heavily edited down, but about seven minutes of game time went by while I was deciding what to do here. This is by far the hardest decision of the entire game. I know that the game is pretty much, probably hinging on this single play. Now there's two possible outcomes here. The first one is, I fight over the Ancestor Recall with Manager. It's unlikely he has a third counterspell. And the reason why he, it's very unlikely he has a third counterspell is if he has a third counterspell, he probably wouldn't be casting Wheel of Fortune because he'd be throwing two counterspells into the graveyard. In fact, frankly, I'm surprised that he wheeled when he had a single counterspell in his graveyard because they're so important. So it's very, very unlikely that he has a second counterspell. With that in mind, if I mana drain the counterspell on my Ancestral Recall and the Ancestral Recall grows up, goes off, there's a reasonable chance, not a great one, but a reasonable chance, it's probably 15%, 15, I didn't calculate the exact odds, it's roughly 15% that one of the top three cards of my deck is 
a counterspell. And I believe that there are three counterspells remaining in my deck at the moment. If I draw one of those three counterspells, then I can not only Ancestral, but I can also counterspell the Wheel of Fortune and stop it cold, and now be three cards ahead. So that was the decision I was facing. However, I ultimately decide that I, it, because I've determined that that Wheel of Fortune is lethal if it resolves, I mean, it's probably gonna kill me for sure. As much as I wanna protect the Ancestral Recall, I can't gamble that one of the top three cards is in fact a counterspell. It's more important that I go with the certainty of being able to, to win the counter war over the Wheel of Fortune, even if that means that my Ancestor Recall is countered. And the other thing to consider too, which went through my head numerous times, is that if the Ancestor resolves, I, I use my Mana Drain on his Counterspell, if the Ancestor resolves, I draw three. There isn't a Counterspell in those, but there's something very important, like say Recall, or a Demonic Tutor, or Regrowth, one of the really key cards in the deck for deciding this matchup, I lose that card. I discard it to the Wheel of Fortune. That's right. So it's it's doubly terrible. Now in retrospect, looking back on this match, I may I, it may have been wrong to do it anyway. I, maybe I should have countered anyway and just gambled. It would have been one of those classic situations of deciding to go to play to win, to take a very high risk play that gives you a higher chance of actually winning the game, even if it might mean that you lose on the spot. In retrospect, that may have been the right play, but I decided to go with the safer play of simply lettering my ancestor recall resolve or be countered and then mana draining the wheel of fortune so that's what i ultimately did so now i declare that i'm mana draining the wheel of fortune and I, I remember looking at his body language when i did that and he's visibly you see him right there he's visibly visibly shaken by the play but of course of course he has a time walk turn and i'm thinking god you know like what can happen next here he's got all that mana available but at least he doesn't have seven new cards in his hand so he's sitting here thinking and he gets to beat me in the face of the factory again for free because my white man is still tapped from casting the moat ages ago. And I'm sitting there thinking, please just say done. Please just say done. Please just say done. And he passes. All right. Whew. Crisis averted. I get to untap here. It was a pretty uneventful time walk turn. Yep. And I'm really thinking now, okay, well, I have a shot here. I don't think he has any more counter magic in his hand. Now, what can I do? So you see me draw time twister there. And I need to actually pause for a second to <laughs> describe my thought process as to why I didn't time twister. All right, so I don't Time Twister there because I determine that my opponent has too much of an advantage on board here. I do have three mana from the Mana Drain, of Mana Draining Wheel of Fortune, and it's not the worst case scenario to Time Twister there, mainly because uh, he does have two Chaos Orbs in play, but I can Time Twister with a, with a Jam Day Tome sitting in play, and the rest of my hand is fairly weak, and I think in retrospect, I probably should have given more thought to Time Twistering. The reason why I didn't do it is, is because of the relative strength of our graveyards. I know that Eric has already cast Ancestor Recall, I have as well, but he's also cast Demonic Tutor, and he has a number of Jambay Tomes in the graveyard and more counter spells than me in the graveyard as well. These are the cards that really the match hinges on. And I don't feel that I have a big enough advantage on board, especially given his two Chaos Orbs that deal with anything I might draw. I don't feel that the chances that I emerge from the Time Twister ahead are particularly high. It's just, it doesn't feel advantageous enough to me. Time Twister is really at its best <clears throat> when you stack the Time Walk up on top of it. So you cast Time Walk and then Time Twister in the very same fashion that he did last turn with his Wheel of Fortune. That's the best use of the card. And that is often enough to win because you get double mana. But because I had really nothing to go with it, it would just be rolling the dice, probably with substantial negative EV. And with that in mind, I decided to go with just playing the Jam Day Tome, testing his hand. I don't think he probably has another distance hand in his hand given that he was so quick to wheel. I think his hand is just removal, creature removal at this point. And that's going to force him to use a Chaos Orb, and I'm going to be able to draw cards. So I decided to just play a Tome off the uh, Wheel of Fortune mana and not Time Twister. And sure enough, he's got another Disenchant in his hand. We were really hoping that he would use one of the orbs on it. Yeah, unfortunately. And I do draw a Lightning Bolt, which is really handy, because that's going to give me a, uh, an easy way to deal with the Mishra's Factory. So you can see I've got Sword, Swords, Time Twister, Shivan Dragon, and Bolt. He comes in with the Factory again. I think I'm currently at... I might be at 14 life. I've, yes, I've been, I think so. Yeah, I think I've been hit by uh, Factory three times. I have tapped a city. Maybe I've tapped a city twice and been hit by a Factory mm -hmm. twice, I think. So I'm at 14. But I'm able to bolt it away. He doesn't fight over it. And we go back to draw go again. And he's looking at his graveyard. And it does matter here. I mean, we see Eric and both you looking at your graveyards throughout the game. Yeah, you'll notice that as the game goes on, we, we start referring to our graveyard more and more because you're trying to calculate the range of not only what your opponent has, but also what you could be drawing. I draw another strip mine, which is very handy. That's the third one this game. And that's super nice too. I'm a little reluctant to play it because he has a strip mine sitting in play, but I'm feeling that the risk of getting mind twisted at this point is too high that I want to get it onto the board because it's basically a preemptive countermeasure against factory number two, which is inevitably coming soon. 
So it's back on his turn. He's thinking for a little while, fingering his mana, wondering what he'd be, he'd be doing. And he asks me how many cards are in my hand, which is always never something you want to hear, especially mid-game when your hands are relatively known commodity. And when he taps five mana, I know exactly what's coming. It's mind twist. And without even any hesitation, there's no reason to bluff. I you toss my hand the whole in the thing away. Yeah, so there goes two swords, Shivan and Time Twister. And, you know, it's bad, but if you're going to get mind twisted, that's that's the kind of hand you expect to lose. Basically, a reactive hand that deals with creatures. I do have a strip mine in play, and um, so I'm protected against at least one factory, although he does have the two orbs in play. And if, if I were him, given how much he's prioritized the uh, the factory so far, I would probably just chaos or he's got so much mana anyway, he's not going to lose anything. Chaos orb away my strip mine and then play a factory to protect it. You see him looking at his graveyard now. So after drawing Mind Twist, one of the most powerful restricted cards in the matchup. Okay, now here he does something that is absolutely mind-boggling that's going to have a ripple effect for the rest of this match. Recall for two, a completely reasonable play. It was a, uh, recall is actually functionally different from the way that it was played back in the original era. The way that the card was originally worded was is that you actually had to sacrifice cards as part of the casting cost. So you had to throw cards in the graveyard while you were announcing the card. If they countered it, you lost the cards that you were pitching, which uh, made the card a lot more risky to run into counter magic, of course. That said, he just mind twisted my entire hand away. So unless that top card is either counter spell or red blast, the recall is going to resolve. But there's no actual risk to having the card countered anymore other than losing access to it. And that's because you actually declare the targets, but you don't actually remove cards from your hand until the spell is resolving which makes it a lot better. So he's casting a recall for two. That's all well and good, and I completely agree with the play, given the fact that he's about to show you his hand, which is Swords of Plowshares, which has been around forever, and the Felwar Stone. What I don't understand is that he sacks his Black Lotus to do it. He definitely chooses his mana in a funny way. Yes, if you look at his board, I can count that's 11 non-Black Lotus mana sources in play. He has 11 mana that isn't Black Lotus that is reusable mana. There's nothing, there's no reason to sacrifice the Lotus at all, other than to maybe like showboat or something. I, I can't honestly understand why he would do that. But for some inexplicable reason, maybe he's used to playing with Yawgmoth's Will. Maybe he's a big vintage player and he's used to just putting the Lotus in the graveyard, you know, without even a thought because you Yawgmoth's Will it back into play. Maybe that's his thought process, I don't know. But it makes absolutely no sense to use Black Lotus. I cannot, I've thought about it quite a bit. I cannot think of a reason why you would do that. And the fact that he actually sacks his Black Lotus there changes the, the dynamic of this game going forward in a way that I'll be commenting on later as we go. But he's recalling for two, and after some thought, you'll see that his targets, I believe, are Counterspell and Demonic Tutor. So you see him filtering through his library here. And I don't have anything of consequence. I think my hand is a City of Brass or something. I haven't drawn anything useful. So I see him get Demonic Tutor and Counterspell. There goes the Felwar Stone and Swords Plowshares. He leaves them face up on the table, I guess, just saving me the trouble of, I guess, writing it down or something. He's just as a courtesy, which is kind of nice. So I'm thinking about, like, what's he going to do, all right? Obviously, he's going to Demonic Tutor. I know what exactly what I would do in his position. Given the fact that I only have one card in my hand, I would Demonic Tutor instantaneously for Brain Geyser and put this game away. He has so much mana in play, although less, because he sacrificed the Lotus for no particular reason. But regardless, he has enough mana to not only Brain Geyser for at least seven or eight cards, but he can also protect it with a Counterspell, unless both of the cards on top of my deck that I've just drawn are Counterspells, and obviously one of them isn't, because I would have Counterspelled Recall. So he guarantees that the card that he just tutored for is going to resolve, because he tutored for a Counterspell. If that's Brain Geyser, he can Brain Geyser for like eight or nine. How do I win from there, right? Impossible. So you'll see him play a Jamdy Tome, and actually, you see him flipping his cards there. You see him flipping his cards there, and the card, other than the counterspell that he uh, recalled for, is Fireball. He tutored for Fireball, which I guess makes sense in the sense that he's maybe feeling like I might be able to get myself back into this game, and I'm just, a, you know, I'm just about to turn the corner after being mind twisted for four. But getting Fireball is all well and good. That's fine. Fireball plus counterspell is excellent. But if you're going to go with that game plan and your opponent's at 14, it might make sense to leave your Black Lotus in place so that you can actually Fireball for lethal. And if you look at his mana, I think that he actually has enough mana with Black Lotus to literally kill me on this turn with Black Lotus. That's 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. Now let me check that again. 4, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. No, he has 12. He has 12, 12 mana sources plus Lotus. That's 15. If you do the mana there, exactly. That's 15 mana. That's lethal fireball. He won't be able to protect it with counterspell for a couple turns. But if he has the Lotus in play, he's two turns 
closer to just going Fireball, Counterspell, kill you. Given the fact that he tutored for a Fireball, it just makes the uh, Black Lotus play even a little bit more confusing. I still, I still have no idea. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll see Eric again one day and ask him. So he's got a Jam Day Tome, and I've just been Mind Twisted, and I actually have a Disenchant in my hand. I think one of the two cards that I drew was Disenchant, but I know that he has a Counterspell in his hand. I know that a Counterspell, a Disenchant on his Tome will almost certainly be countered. And with that in mind, I decide that I, I need to wait. I'm gonna, I'm gonna let him draw a few more cards. He doesn't have a lot of counter spells left, and he probably has a fair number of cards left in his deck. Assuming that he has the usual gamut of removal and stuff, that, that I can probably let him draw a few more cards with the Tome before I need to get rid of it. I'm hoping to protect it. And then he plays a second Jam Day Tome. So that's, I believe that's the third one played this game. I have three in my deck as well, but you know, his were, his were much closer to the uh, top of his deck than mine were. I've, I think I've only drawn one this game which you saw destroyed earlier. Now I'm curious as to why he is not attempting to destroy your mana base with the orbs. Um, I think that he's he's making the right play, which is basically to just keep the orbs in play to deal with any unforeseen threat. He doesn't really know my deck. That way you see me disenchanting one of his tomes finally when he tapped all of his mana at the end of the turn. But this is basically just a band-aid solution. The tome, one tome running is enough to kill you. Two of them is, is completely lethal. And the game is very rapidly slipping away. You see him playing more moxes here. And now with those two moxes drawn, if you, I remember I was talking about drawing two more mana sources. So this literally would have been the lethal turn. He would have been able, had he kept the Lotus in play, he would have been able to go play the Mox and sack the Black Lotus, leaving two blue mana untapped, Fireball of the face for 14. And have counter magic. And have counter magic backup, which means that I would have had to be insanely lucky. And there's to the third tome. And so that's tome number four, actually. Oh, excuse yeah, me. Yeah, I destroyed there. two. Two of them have been disenchanted, but now that's two more. So I'm sitting here thinking, okay, well, what the hell do I do, right? The guy's jammed it toming with Abandon. I have a counter spell and a bunch of mana in my hand. I can't affect the board. I've got to just sit here and pray that he makes a mistake. I mean, sometimes you just reach a point in the game where you've effectively lost on board. All you can do is just hope your opponent does something crazy and gives you an opportunity to get back into the game. So you see him checking his mana. And speaking of something crazy, Eric just did exactly that. And so he just taps out completely for a huge fireball. Yes. So he's tapping out for a lethal fireball with no counter magic backup. He's just raw dogging it, tapping all of his mana. I've got, I think, six card, five or six cards in my hand. I've just been, other than the disenchant, I haven't done anything since the mind twist, really. I've just been watching him. Watching I think him that he cards feels time. that because you didn't counter that third and fourth tome, you just uh, don't have, you have you nothing. Know, that's actually something I hadn't considered. You know, the fact that I immediately just said yes, yes. And the truth of the matter is, I think I just drew the counter spell that turn. So you top deck. So it's not like I, I had some amazing discipline and I just let him play Jam Day Tomes all day without countering. Although truth be told, once he's got one out, it's one is almost just as bad as two is at that point. I probably would have let him have it. Hope that he gets super unlucky and he draws all the way to the bottom of his deck and I get lucky and draw three counters and I can, we can fight a counter over the game ending card and I win and he gets decked. So that was actually probably my only way to actually win the game at this point. So instead, he just launches this fireball in my face. Now remember, of course, he has a counter spell in his hand. If he has Black Lotus still sitting in play, that's the end of the game right here. But instead, without hesitation, of course, I cast counter spell to not die. So there goes the counter spell in the graveyard. He shrugs and goes, oh, good on you. You had it. My hand, of course, is just garbage. It's Cities of Brass and, and, and a Mox Emerald. So I've got one turn here. This has to be the card, Sam, right now. Regrowth drawn off the top. Oh my god. I said before, maybe your opponent gives you an opening, maybe your opponent gives you a chance to actually win a game, and he just did that. Not only did he tap out completely and surrender his ability to counter with two Jam Day Tomes and two Chaos Orbs in play, with no man available to use anything, but I top deck, I finally top deck something good to punish him with. So this is the second hardest turn of the entire game. I have to decide what do I regrowth for? So you're going to see me go and look at my graveyard. I'm going to pause again in a second here to describe the thought process. Okay, so I'm going to go check the graveyard first. Now, looking through my graveyard, there are three cards that matter. Time Twister, Ancestral Recall, and Brain Geyser. Those are the only three that I would even consider for a second. Eric looks nervous. You can see him twitching there. He's shuffling his cards and thinking, hmm, maybe I should have, maybe I should have protected that fireball. So I count his graveyard. Because my first thought is, maybe he's drawn so many cards at Jam Day Tome that I can just win on the spot with Brain Geyser. And unfortunately, I drew my single mana drain earlier in the game and had to use it on Wheel of Fortune. Had I had the good fortune to have Mana Drain in my hand there instead of Counterspell, the game would have just ended on the spot, of course. I would have Mana Drained the 14 damage Fireball, that's 15 colorless mana into my pool on my turn. Instantaneously just regrowth Brain Geyser, tap out Brain Geyser in for 25 or something and kill him. Because I think he, at this point, when I did a deck count, he had 18 cards left in his deck. So Brain Geyser would have been lethal. Unfortunately, he's out of range and I can't win 
with Brain Geyser right now, even though I do have a substantial amount of money with the, or mana with the um, Emerald and the City of Brass, I have 14 total. With that in mind, the fact that I'm not gonna Time Twister for the very reason that I stated before, his graveyard is stacked completely. He has two copies of Jam Day Tome and two Chaos Orbs sitting in play. Even if I Time Twister there, unless I get unbelievably lucky and I draw multiple Disenchants, Time Walk, and Mind Twist, there's probably no way that I can win from that position. I'm actually gonna be, I'll be twistering as a huge underdog. And uh, he'll likely just untap, possibly mind twist my hand away. Certainly will just ride those two tomes off into the sunset and I'll lose. So I discount time twister relatively quickly. Ancestral is tempting because it gives me a lot more mana available to work with if I draw something really impactful like recall off of it or mind twist. But at the end of the day, I decide that I really have to go for brain geyser. That's the only thing that makes any sense. Now the question is, how much do I brain geyser for? You'll see in a second here and I'll explain why. So here I am casting regrowth and I declare my target. I'm sure, I wonder if Eric is thinking, man, he was so patient with that regrowth. I walked right into that. So now I have to think about what do I geyser for? You can see that I have a total of, uh, I believe 12 untapped mana after that. That is five plus nine plus three, yeah, so it's 12. All right, so thinking, I think for a long time, and ultimately I decide that the correct number is seven, and this is why. Right now, looking at my board, there are two Moxes remaining in my deck as well as a Soul Ring. These are all things that I calculated by just looking at my graveyard and obviously I know my deck well. I also have Demonic Tutor and Time Walk left in my deck and Recall. Those are the cards that are gonna decide this game. I have to maximize the chances of either getting Time Walk or getting Demonic Tutor into Time Walk in order to have more mana accessible to punish him with whatever the remaining cards are. That's the only scenario that wins me this game at this point. I, I'm basically choosing a line of play that's gonna result in me decking him this turn with Brain Geyser as the only way to possibly win, because this is my one opening. It's got two tomes and two, uh, two Chaos Orbs, tons and tons of mana, full hand. It's very, very unlikely, and I know he still has that counter spell as well. So this is my one opening. I have to maximize my chances. It is a little tempting to go Geyser for a few more cards and just gamble on hitting the Time Walk and one of the two remaining Moxes, which uh, is something that I did consider. But in terms of statistics, it's much more likely that I'll hit one of the two outs plus a mana source off the Brain Geyser, and that'll allow me to time walk and potentially also hit the recall, which will allow me to win the game. So with that in mind, a Brain Geyser for seven with three mana untapped makes the most sense. And so here we go. Tapping all the mana. You can see I've got three untapped there, two cities and a volcanic island, and I declare a Brain Geyser for seven. There's seven cards. All right, let's see if I, <laughs> let's see if I guess correctly. Here they come, one at a time. One, and that two, is a disenchant, a land, soul ring, demonic tutor, counterspell, and two more lands. And it actually worked, Sam. It worked. I hit pretty much the scenario that I needed, an extra mana source as well as either demonic tutor on time walk. Now, unfortunately, it's missing the other piece of the puzzle, which is the recall. And if, if one of those other cards had been recall, and there was not a particularly low chance of that happening, if one of the other cards had been recall, I would have actually won this game on this turn. Here you take damage off of City of Brass. Yeah, You've so I've got I one color is floating. I think I'm down to 13 and I'm getting Time Walk, of course. Really the only choice right now because I need all of my mana back. And, and uh, Eric makes a comment about that too. He says, I clearly, as soon as I cast a Monarch Tutor, he says, I guess you didn't get the Time Walk. I wish I would have said, well, I got that too. <laughs> and I'm tutoring for a recall to kill you. But unfortunately, that's not what happened. <laughs> So I'm thinking to myself, all right, I got a million mana now. There's Soaring, allows me to cast Time Walk. Now you're at 12. Yeah, and, I, and I'm sure his heart must be thudding at this point, seeing this, your opponent just drew seven and cast Time Walk. There's so many things that I can do to him right now. And I still have one shot here, Sam, one shot to draw Recall for the full punish. If I draw Recall, it's a very simple line of play from there. I recall for Time Walk, Regrowth, and Brain Geyser. I cast the Brain Geyser on him for a modest amount, maybe 10 cards. I then cast Time Walk. I regrow Brain Geyser. I untap and I Brain Geyser him a second time to win the game. That would be what I would do. And unfortunately, my top deck is this lowly disrupting scepter. Oh, no. <laughs> and nothing else. I have no way to punish him. Recall did not show up. And the one window of opportunity has probably closed because my hand is, other than the counterspell, my hand is just all more mana. It does show you something about these decks though, that they're so dependent on Jam Day Tome running. You run so many mana sources, I'm actually running 29, and I think Eric is probably running at least that many, possibly even 30, that if you don't get a Tome running, half of your deck just does nothing by mid game. And uh, you're really, really at the mercy of just getting lucky with top decks. 
So I discard a, uh, use the scepter on him. Of course, he just throws away his swords. His hand is now disenchant. I think that's the third one. Plus, that's a power sink, actually. And a balance. And a balance, which is another card that I'm not main decking. And I, as far as I can tell, with the exception of two swords to plowshares and I guess Mishra's factories, that balance is really his only creature defense. So Eric's deck has really, really set up well for the mirror matchup. He has uh, Felwar Stones for acceleration. He's got uh, more counter spells than me, I think, because he is playing multiple power sinks. He has the factories, which are a tremendous pressure thing. He has copy artifact, which is great, and he's not running very many uh, plowshares. So I'm going to use finally use that strip mine that I played ages ago. You notice that he played a factory before even considering chaos orbing or strip mining my own strip mine to protect it, which uh, I think is an oversight. He's tapping some more mana, and now he's going to flip a chaos orb. Here we go. The first chaos orb flip of the match. Eric is up there. And to his credit, I think he flips from too high. That's clearly more than a foot. It's about a two feet. Yeah, here it comes. And, and he misses. A miss. And I can't believe he misses. And he makes a comment about the fact that that is the only time in the tournament that he missed. I think it was probably nerves. And you can see him, you see him flushing red and I think feeling pretty foolish. Now, if you miss and hit your volcanic island, does your volcanic island No, get it destroyed? doesn't. It no, doesn't. You actually declared, you notice I lifted the scepter up and placed it on that's his play mat to make it easier. In fact, that's actually doing him a favor because the tables can be a little bouncy. And if you hit. <laughs> If you hit on a hard table, the, the card tends to bounce more. Unfortunately, he's got a disenchant. Disenchant number three is a backup. So your scepter here is basically two for ones. In. <laughs> it does. It, it does a lot actually three for ones, in, right? Because it got a set. It got a swords as well. That's right. Yeah. So it got a. It got a chaos or one of the two chaos orbs a disenchant and the swords. It's not bad actually. It's like a, It's like an ancestor recall. Not too bad for a scepter, but I really need to need tomes. He's down to one orb now, and now we're basically just going to sit here and we're going to play the brain geyser game. The question is: Is can I draw into counter magic? Can I draw into counter magic and recall to still win the game before he draws uh, either a recursion card like a time twister, which I expect that he's playing with, given the fact that he, I saw Wheel of Fortune, or before he draws some other way to uh, end the game in his favor. So we're just going to back and forth. Obviously, it favors him massively because he's drawing two cards a turn and I only have one. So he's counting my deck. At this point, I think I have roughly... I think I have roughly 20 cards. No, I don't have that many cards. Maybe 16 or 17 cards remaining. And I think Eric is down below 10. We're just looking at each other's graveyards. This is a this is a very common end game scenario between two control decks when all the other methods of actually winning the game in a conventional manner have been exhausted. But Eric is just drawing two cards a turn and there he draws his Brain Geyser. So now he's drawn, I think with the mana that he has available, that is almost lethal, not quite. It's enough to take me down to about maybe three cards left. And he's counting his deck. I think he's down to just seven there. Thinking, thinking. His ears are very red. I wonder what that means. I didn't see that from my angle, but from this angle, you can see his ears have turned crimson. And I think he's kind of feeling that he may have screwed this game up and potentially thrown it away. Because after that fireball, you really yeah. I mean, the game out. the game really flipped over. I mean, I, I had a legit opportunity to close the game on that next turn because he just surrendered complete control in order to roll the dice. But unfortunately, he's got. I guess that isn't a power sink. So that's two counter spells and brain guys are in his hand. He has pretty much a perfect setup. He's just short on mana. Hey, Black Lotus is a good card. He's short on mana to geyser me to death. So I think I've drawn another Jam Day Tome here. Yeah, I'm just thinking about how to tap my mana. I elect not to uh, tap white, I think. I'm gonna tap, yeah, tap the useless emerald. I play another Tome. And I think he's got a disenchant in his hand. Yeah, that's, that's the fourth disenchant. But I mean, to his credit, he's drawn almost his entire deck. I wouldn't expect it to live. I get to at least can't drip off of it. Eight mana cantrip. And people say Jam Day Tome should be restricted in the format. And in response, he also draws a card off of Tome, hoping to maybe get something. Yeah, it's interesting because he's running out of cards. But uh, I think that he's just, he needs to build more mana. So there is power sync, so he is playing with the card. Uh, there's factory number three, I believe. And I've got two counter spells in my hand. I'm honestly feeling like I have a reasonable shot at this. If I can draw my red elemental blast or I can draw my recall, I might be able to close this game out. I have no idea what his hand is and that he already has two counter spells again. So I'm just going to play land. I've got plenty of defense against the factory still. Now, should he be orbing there? There's no reason to orb. Not, not, no reason at all, actually. I think that uh, the orb is still just a fail safe against something unknown that I might play, maybe a mirror universe. There's a lot of different things that I could have. And he's out of disenchants now, so it's his last its his last ability to affect a, an artifact in play. So I'm checking his graveyard here. Still just thinking about the Brain Geyser play, checking my own graveyard. And I think right now I'm just assessing counterspells. I'm trying to get a sense of how many counterspells he might have, and how many I may be contending with. I obviously don't have anything to force the game with. I'm just waiting to draw either Mind Twist 
I'm waiting to draw um, my own recall. Just hoping to draw one of those cards. I draw sorts of flashers, but at least that's some more defense against the factor. I'm not going to just die to it. I'm just going to play a pearl here. Chill, pass the turn back. Oh, so stressful. He's going to draw another card with Jamie Tome. He's down to about six cards left in his deck. It's so tense. So here, what are your outs? Because he's only got six cards left. Yeah, well, the uh, really, uh, my game plan is getting... I know that his hand is stacked, right? We're both setting up something that's the last play of the game, really. And my hope, really, is to draw Mind Twist, I think, at this point. Mind Twist, at least, is a black spell. So if he's main decking Red Elemental Blast, which is a totally reasonable thing you see a lot in the format, Brain Geyser's a lot less likely to resolve, and it costs a lot more mana to, to do something deadly with it. Although he's so low in cards, it's roughly the same amount. Um, those are the three cards. So the three cards, I'm obviously sandbagging cards for recall as well. So my intention is to draw Mind Twist, Brain Geyser, or I obviously I can't draw Brain Geyser, what am I saying? I'm to draw Mind Twist or Recall. Push one of those two cards through and then win off the back of the other one. Unfortunately, he's just drawn Regrow. And so he's looking at his graveyard, he's thinking about what to regrow. Keep in mind now I'm at 10 life. I believe I've taken, um, I, I went down to 12 off my cities and I've taken one more hit from a factory. So he regrows Fireball. And he's thinking, and he's thinking, and I'm sitting there thinking, man, just please cast that spell on me. Because I, I feel this is his last chance to win the game. I, get, I guess he has a Brain Geyser, but still, it's still going to be a while until he can resolve Brain Geyser, and I can stop that with Red Blast. And I'm hoping just maybe tap out and Fireball me, or maybe Fireball me with that single counterspell in your hand. Although he's drawn a lot of cards, the chances of him having another counterspell are high. And he, sure enough, he casts, and when he casts Fireball for lethal, that's exactly 10 damage. With four mana untapped, I know I'm pretty screwed. And he's got Counterspell, and I've got another Counterspell. And there's Counterspell, and there's the game. I pack it in. Fireball for 10 to the face, wins it for Eric, and we move on to game two. Okay, so we've cut to the very beginning of the second game, and you've already sideboarded. We don't see that, but Brian, tell us a little bit about your sideboard choices, because we didn't get to see that. We know that sideboarding a certain way does make or break this matchup. Yeah, absolutely. When two control decks in this format fight each other, often the deciding factor is the sideboard cards. And... I feel, honestly, that I have a big advantage post-sideboard. Eric's deck is kind of almost pre-sideboarded against me. Obviously, he's, I, his deck is not pre-sideboarded, li literally, but the fact that he runs so little creature kill in the first game and he doesn't have cards like Moat and Abyss, which you traditionally see in these kind of decks, to rein in the aggro strategies, gives him a big advantage in the first game. In the second game, of course, I'm able to remove my moats, which may seem a little crazy given the fact that I took 10 damage of factory, uh, roughly 10 damage, I guess maybe 8 eight factory damage in the first game. But the truth of the matter is that Moat is not a reliable solution to the factories. If the factories kill you, you've already lost the game because of the other stuff that matters. So Moat comes out, Lightning Bolts come out because those are entirely a countermeasure to kill creatures, not specifically Mishra's factories. I feel that my deck is more than well equipped to deal with the four factory threat because I have four disenchants, four strip mines. I've brought in a pair of uh, the card Divine Offering which is uh, an instant from Legends that kills an artifact for the same cost, one colorless, one white, at instant speed. It doesn't kill enchantments, but there's practically no enchantments in this format anyway. And it has the added benefit of allowing you to gain life equal to the converted mana cost of the artifact that you destroy with the Divine Offering. So I have two, pairs of, uh, two copies of those. I brought in a copy of the card Dust to Dust, which is a seldom seen card from the dark that's also very powerful because it costs uh, two, white, two white mana and one colorless, but it exiles two artifacts permanently. So they can't even be recursed. And it can be backbreaking in this matchup, especially against someone that's using Felwar Stones for their mana base. In the testing that I've done against this Felwar Stone based deck, and it's actually one of the reasons why I'm not using Felwar Stones myself, if you draw, and I unfortunately only have access to one Dust to Dust, having two would have been really, really awesome. But if you draw multiple copies of Dust to Dust, or often even one, you can just destroy so much of their mana, so much of their mana production, you can often in ignore their artifacts, the other artifacts, the ones that draw cards, because you just blow up a Felwar Stone and a Mox and strip mana land. That kills three mana sources for two cards and can often set them back so far, especially if they're running factories and they're running a very finite number of blue sources. They're actually relying on those Felwar Stones for blue, that if you're able to blow the blue, the Felwar Stones up, they often don't have the ability to even fight counter wars with you for a long period of time, and that will allow you to snowball, land your artifacts, you can kill their white mana with strip mines. You, they can't even attack with the factories because that's the last of their mana. And if you blow up their factories with uh, other artifact removal, they're left with nothing and they have no way to get back into the game. So in addition to those three spells, I also brought in three additional copies of Red Elemental Blast. 
So that brings my entire, my count of those up to four. And given how much the blue cards decide this, this game, um, or this matchup, you really can't have enough red elemental blasts. Although I may come to rue those words later on, as you'll see as this game unfolds. And I expect that Eric probably sideboarded in a similar fashion, probably bringing in more artifact kill, potentially more, certainly bring in the red elemental blast as well. That's what I kind of expect from him. I do have blue elemental blasts, at least in the sideboard of my current deck. This version of the deck does not have blue elemental blasts. A lot of people use those because they give you the ability to not only potentially blast down red blasts from decks that would run them, that also have red creatures and red damage, but they have the added benefit of dealing with the card Blood Moon, which is a uh, constant threat when you're playing a five color mana base. And my deck is actually, prior to this tournament, I was actually running Blood Moon in my sideboard and had five basic lands in my main deck. So I was already pre-inoculated against Blood Moon and in fact used it myself. Because of the fact that I intend to use Blood Moon means that I don't need Blue Elemental Blast to kill Blood Moon, so I wasn't using Blue Blast. And uh, I think different, different builds of the deck absolutely require the card because you can't just lose to Blood Moon on turn two or something. You just feel foolish. So that's my sideboard. It's six cards. The cards I removed, I believe, are... I've left a few copies of Swords of Plashers in because one of the common strategies with these control decks is to bring in some large creatures, generally creatures that aren't blue, uh, because those would die to Red Blast. So people will bring in white creatures like Sarah Angel, and they will attempt to... Um, or possibly even red creatures like Shivan Dragon or Sedge Troll, and they intend to kill you with them after you've removed your Swords to Plowshares. So I, in anticipation of that, I've removed only, I think, two of my swords, plus they have the added benefit of killing factories, and I don't want to have to use Divine Offering on Mishra's factories. I'd rather save those for his artifacts and his Felwar Stones and things like that. Um, I've removed two Lightning Bolts, two copies of Swords of Plowshares, Moat, and I believe Time Twister as well, because I feel that I should be able to win the game on one trip through the deck now that we've sideboarded, and should be able to keep his artifacts under control and win with my uh, superior mana base. That's, that's basically my plan. My extra artifact kill on my superior mana base, I think, should give me the advantage. And I actually do genuinely feel that I'm favored in this matchup in uh, post-sideboard. Not, not tremendously, still, because of all the other reasons that I've described, but I feel probably at least a favorite, if not a heavy favorite, post-sideboard. And uh, let's, let's see what goes on from here. Okay, yeah, at least now you have a slightly better matchup because you've been tweaked, but all right, let's take a look. And we'll see how it goes. Okay, so, and you notice that Eric goes first, he opts to play first, and look at that, turn one, Library of Alexandria again. So he played first, and notice, remember in the first game, when he played first and he opened the game with Library of Alexandria, and I know this because the video shows him briefly with Library in his opening hand, he did not play it on turn one. And I assumed from the first game, having not been privy to his hand, that he had drawn the Library of Alexandria on turn three and played it then. Or he had the self-discipline to play blue mana sources and wait to see if I had strip mines before he played it. Now I actually know the truth, at least in my estimation, is that the only reason he played blue mana sources at the start of the first game was because of that counterspell. Had he not had a counterspell in his opening hand, he would have just played the library right away, and I would have, uh, well, I mean, I would have fallen into a hole much quicker because I'm not going to bring Geyser for two on turn one, right? He's going to go right up to seven and start drawing with the library immediately. Fortunately, in this game, he just plays the library right off the bat. In my opening hand, I actually, you don't see it before, but I had to mulligan this game, unfortunately. My opening hand was a bunch of white spells and a single underground sea. So I mulligan once. Off that draw, I got a very, very good hand, actually. I got four mana sources, including, a, I believe, a City of Brass, as well as a Strip Mine and Counterspell and Red Elemental Blast. So I got, short of getting something degenerate like uh, Ancestor Recall or something, or my own Library of Alexandria, I got pretty close to the best hand that I could hope for in this matchup. And fortunately, as, you, as you'll see me do, I think um, I have a strip mine to deal with his library before he can draw a card with it. But I mean, what can I do, right? The guy, the guy has Library of Alexandria in his opening hand in both games. The card is so ridiculous. And just uh, as an aside comment, there is a controversy brewing right now. And I actually wrote an article recently that percolated around in the old school ecosystem a bit about whether or not strip mine should be on the restricted list in this format. I am a strong advocate for four strip mines in the format. I think that not only does it keep Dex mana bases honest, and it reigns in some of the crazy lands like Misha's Workshop and stuff, and Bizarre Baghdad to a lesser extent, although without the good reanimation spells and targets, that card's not quite as good. It, it has a few more years until it becomes insane. But Library of Alexandria, by itself, 
is the most powerful card in the old school format. Ancestor Recall is the most universally strong card, but Library of Alexandria is the pure most powerful card. And if you do not have four strip mines in your deck to stop it, and your opponent plays a library on turn one, you've pretty much lost the game 90% of the time at least. And having games in a format that people are trying to take seriously, that has some degree of credibility, that are literally decided by whether or not your opponent draws a one outer, kind of undermines the integrity of the format and I think makes it less interesting and certainly less diverse. If I had had only one strip mine in my deck under the uh, European rules as, as they're called, I would have lost both of these games pretty much on the spot when my opponent played the library. The chances that I had my one outer, my one strip mine in my hand at the start of this game, especially after mulliganing, are practically zero. I mean, they're like 5% maybe. So he would have just killed me on turn one here with library. There's no way I'm going to win if my opponent is drawing two cards a turn. It is practically impossible to win from that point. And you got to have four strip mines to deal with it because this scenario happens. Sometimes your opponent just has a library twice in a row and you can't do anything about it. But I've got a strip mine and away it goes and we continue the game without me having to sit there and, and die to that stupid land. I really wish I had drawn Library Alexandria earlier in both of these games because as we saw in the first game, I believe that Eric only has a single copy of st a strip mine in his deck. So he goes land soaring. And you're carefully watching him. Yeah, I'm carefully watching every draw, of course. So I play my volcanic island and because I had to strip mine, I don't have, I actually have a disenchant in my hand. And normally I would just flash disenchant that tome, which he's able to cast on turn two because he's got, you can see he's got Felwar Stone, two lands and a recall. I would just instantly disenchant the tome. But then I draw Chaos Orb here. And that really changes the line of play a lot. I would normally have disenchanted the tome, but because I have Chaos Orb, I now have a roundabout way to destroy Jam Day Tome eventually. I don't need to deal with it right now. I don't know how much mana he has in his hand. And I decide that it makes a lot more sense to destroy the Sol Ring because this could be killing two birds with one stone. And that if he doesn't have any more land in his hand, I can ignore the Tome for the foreseeable future. And I, maybe I'm gonna even go after more of his mana with Chaos Orb and keep him off the Tome forever. There's no way to know what your opponent's mana base is. I need to at least see that. But either way, he's not gonna be able to use the Tome for a turn or two turns unless he does that. <laughs> he has a Felwar Stone and that sort of screws my whole plans up and a factory. So now he threatens to use the Tome. And the worst part here is, and I'm gonna pause in a second, So I play my orb, that's a no-brainer. Now the question is, do I use the orb right now? So as you may remember from the beginning of this video when I was discussing the peculiar property of Chaos Orb as the only artifact in all the magic that can be stopped with Disenchant in response to its activation, you notice that Eric has a Felwar Stone and a Misha's Factory untapped. Well, I have a City of Brass in play, which means that Felwar Stone is making every color, including white. It's very likely also that he's brought an extra artifact hill in the form of Divine Offering. So, with three cards in his hand, there's a pretty reasonable chance that he has either Disenchant or Divine Offering in his hand. I know looking at my hand, which contains, I believe right now, Red Elemental Blast and Counterspell and maybe another Red Elemental Blast or just some more lands, that that orb is my only way of killing off Jam Day Tome. If I go to activate my Chaos Orb right now and he has a Disenchant in his hand for the orb, I probably lose the game immediately. Unless I get super lucky and I draw an Artifact Kill spell right away. I probably lose the game on the spot because now he's got a free tome going and I've got the same problem as the library and no way out of it. So as much as it pains me to let my opponent untap four mana when he's got a jam to tome in play, I do not use the orb and I just have to be disciplined here. Plus it has the added benefit of keeping two mana untapped uh, to use a counter spell versus just one for the red blast in case he decides to tap out and mind twist me or something else. So it's not the end of the world. So it goes back to Eric's turn and he's going to be faced of course with the dilemma if he does in fact have a counter spell in hand of whether or not to use the tome. But then he's got a mox too. So he's got six mana. He has the ability now to threaten, to threaten to counter, to disenchant or counterspell in response to my disenchant after drawing a card with the tome. It's just awful. And but here then, he's swinging in with the Yeah, factory. but then he attacks with the factory. He just can't help himself. He just needs to, and that takes all the pressure off my shoulders. So now I feel a lot better when he attacks with the factory actually. And he runs it into white mana too, which is just crazy. So at the end of his turn, uh, at the end of my turn, I just pass and he uh, and he activates his tome and I get to flip my orb and I do a pretty poor job of it. Honestly. Barely landing a yeah, corner. Yeah, I'm not proud of that flip, but it did. It got the job done. I clipped the corner of his tome and killed it because he tapped out at the end of my turn and that removed the contingency of him disenchanting in response. So at least I felt okay about that. And we go back to draw go. He has a strip mine and a city in Yeah, there. his case strip mine. He kills my city brass. This is the only strip mine in his deck. I'm nearly certain of that. Beats me for two, so now I don't even have white mana to, to deal with the factory, and he taps out and casts a tome. But fortunately, I do have that counter spell for my opening draw, and I'm able to stop it. 
and he's down to just one card in his hand. We can see that it's recall, so he has no disenchant. And now it's my turn to take control of this game. I draw the library, which of course doesn't matter given that I think I only have two cards left in my hand, and I play my own tome. And I'm thinking, man, unless that last card in his hand is disenchant, suddenly my position in this game is massively improved. What are the odds that he's just gonna say, draw disenchant right off the top? Oh, and there's the disenchant. <laughs> 100%. What can you do, right? Sometimes your opponent just walks in water. It doesn't matter what the sequencing is. And then, bizarrely, he decides to recall here. So this is a really, really strange play to me. And he's recalling for X equals one. For X equals one. And I'm gonna pause here to discuss this play. So I know why he's doing this, right? He's going with the same plan that I had at the beginning of the game. When he, when he went soaring Jammed Atome, I reasoned, well, there's a reasonable chance he doesn't have any more mana in hand, so I'm gonna go and attack his mana. I'm gonna kill off the Sol Ring, that'll buy me time to deal with the Tome and see what's going on, because I have the Chaos Orb as a backup. In this case, he, th he throws away Recall, an incredibly important resource, as you've seen from the previous game, in order to get a Strip Mine. And you see me reaching for my Volcanic Island here, just naturally assuming, okay, he's clearly gonna strip me off two blue here. He senses vulnerability, which is reasonable because my hand size is pretty small. It also takes me off the Jamdi Tome. But then he corrects me and says, no, 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 I'm killing your Library of Alexandria, which makes no sense at all, other than the fact that he's maybe thinking that this game's gonna go another like six or seven or eight turns along, and Brian's gonna draw back up to seven cards, and then he's gonna be able to use the Library of Alexandria, but he's preemptively doing it. But in that case, like, why do it now? Just wait. I think what he sees here is you have Tome as well as Library. And he's like, okay, you're on the back foot, but you've been keeping up with me tit for tat. And that's why he's trying to increase this clock by smashing in with Mishra's Factory. Yeah, maybe this is just a tempo play. I mean, that, that may have, that's, it's an interesting perspective to see that. And maybe he's just figuring, if I strip my one land, there's a reasonable chance that Brian doesn't have a fourth land. So I don't have to worry about the tone for a bit. That's also gonna give me free reign with the factory. But in that case too, he's seen Lightning Bolt from the previous game. So he knows that I have Lightning Bolt. I do have a Ruby in play, but he has the ability here with the Disenchant. If you're gonna go with that line, if you're gonna go after your opponent's mana, which he's clearly prioritizing, then go all the way. Strip mine the Volcanic Island and Disenchant the Ruby. Drop me down to two mana. That's gonna leave me with just an Underground Sea and a Library in play. The factory's gonna have free reign now because there's nothing in black that can kill it. They haven't made anything like that yet. I don't have very many cards left in my hand and that factory may just go the distance. Certainly the tome is not gonna matter for a while. And if you're gonna, if you're willing to cast recall for a strip mine, throwing away an extra land and the recall, which is a very precious resource in order to strip my one land, go all the way, kill off my mana and, and hope that it works. At minimum, if Eric feels like he's ahead, he should have milked that recall for just a few more points of value. Yeah, that's true. Although he does have an opportunity to cast it here. Notice that I'm completely tapped out. He's got to know that I've boarded in Red Blast because that's just the standard thing. So he may be casting the recall here because he sees this as one of the few opportunities where the card will not be Red Blasted. It's very, very hard to fight a counter war when your opponent is using Red Blast to stop you. They're just too compact and too cheap. To, uh, to really fight counter wars over unless it's for a super critical spell. So I think that's why he's doing it. But again, I think that in his position, if I was gonna go the land destruction route, I would have gone for colored mana for sure and uh, and just risked the chance that my opponent still had more land in their hand because you're gonna get some hits of, of a factory in regardless. So he's strip mines and you see me looking at the volcanic island and I'm incredulous when he points at the uh, when he points at the factory, but I army at the library. And then instead of disenchanting my jam to my, my ruby, he just hits me for two again. Here we go, jamming in, that's right. Yeah, so I'm like, oh, awesome, cool. All right, I've got free reign with the jam to And I do have another land, of course, because these decks have nothing but lands. Tome's running again. Pass the turn he, he back draws, to Eric. He draws another City of Brass. He's only got one card in his hand. And factory beats in for two. Yeah, that's gonna add up quickly. And he just passes, and he lets me draw another card off the jam to He doesn't disenchant it in response to me tapping out. I just, I don't understand it. So you were able to get a little bit of value out so of it. So I get two extra cards right now off the tome. It should have been disenchanted a while ago. And I'm not really sure, maybe he's holding the disenchant as a way to kill my factories, thinking that he's just going with the pure factory plan. Eric comes in two more. Yeah, so you see my hand now is just three cards. It's time walk and two red bus. And now he finally disenchants. I'm tapping out in response here and drawing a card. And that's a mistake there. You notice that I tapped uh, Volcanic Island over Underground Sea with two red blasts in hand. If he had drawn Ancestor Recall there, I would have felt so dumb. Fortunately, he didn't have it. Because, yeah, watching your opponent Ancestral when you've tapped two red sources for no reason, you just feel like the stupidest person in the world. Look at my hand, though. It's Island, two blasts, and Time Walk. And this factory is still beating me in the face. That is no good. I think I'm... I'm not sure about my life total. I think I'm down to about 10 at this point. We're still playing Drago. 
And Eric, Eric, I believe, has drawn a red blast now. I'm playing an island, and this is just a desperation time walk. I'm just casting this to cycle. I need to draw white mana or an answer to the factory. And Eric thinks about it for a little while. And since he's totally on board with the, he checks my graveyard, of course. But since he's totally just pot committed now, I think, to the factory plan. You'll see in a second what he decides to do. I'm just like, give me my graveyard back. There's nothing in there. And he's thinking, and I believe, yeah, the other card in his hand is Demonic Tutor. And so he red blasts the time walk. And given the fact that the card in his hand is Demonic Tutor, I think that using the red blast there is a bit impulsive. And I have an immediate punish for it in the form of a strip mine. Clearly he's red blasting because he doesn't want me to buy time to deal to draw a solution to his factory. And then I already have a solution in my hand, which is awesome. And I've got another Jamie to Tome here, which is wonderful. And of course a, a turn stacked up. Well, I guess the time walk, no, that's right, he blasted the time walk. So it goes back to his turn. And he draws another factory right after I draw a strip mine to deal with the first one. I'm just gonna destroy it. And I remember when he just, I, and I knew that he'd draw the, I, I watched it in his hand because I always watch my opponent's hands. I watched him draw another factory right away. I'm just like, God damn it. Not even one second of breathing room. So he casts Demonic Tutor here. And here I feel like I make a very big mistake that is definitely worthy of pausing the footage for. Another technique that uh, has served me very well over the years is uh, some people might call it, um, or people have, other people have utilized the, the tactic and it's, it's definitely within the confines of the rules. It's sort of the Jedi mind trick. It's it, when you're in a situation where your opponent has to make a decision like a tutor, there's no harm in giving them some advice, some friendly advice. You can either give them advice or you can do it even a little bit more forceful. You can make an assumption about what they're going to do and tell them what that assumption is. And as soon as he tutored, because keep in mind, I have two red elemental blasts in my hand and an untapped ruby. The correct play for me in this position is to tell him that he's going to Ancestor Recall. And I remember it going through my head thinking to myself, you need to tell him that he's going to Ancestor Recall. You need to get that idea into his head that Ancestor Recall is the right play here. And so in response to him demonic tutoring, the, the correct play from me should have been something to the effect of, oh man, demonic tutor again. Okay, well, I guess you just draw three or something like that. Obviously, I would, I would think it through a little bit and probably do a little better of an acting job, a little bit more authentic, but I would sort of slump in my chair and say, yes, yeah, so you just draw three. Something like that to sort of indicate that I'm frustrated. And he goes, man, yeah, I do draw three, right? Ancestral's a great card, it's a great feeling, I'm gonna cast it. So he casts his Ancestral Recall. I do have Red Blast waiting in the wings, and now my Tome is just gonna hopefully take over the game before the factory kills me, and he's got no cards left in his hand. I should have done that, and I didn't say anything. Because he's got nothing else going on. No, he's got nothing else going on. And I'm hoping, 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 of course, that he gets Ancestral Recall, because in most cases that's correct, except for that little ruby sitting there. So to, to uh, to Eric's great credit and to his discipline, he ultimately does not get Ancestor Recall. As tempting and powerful as that card is, he gets something much more instantly prudent. Let's take a look at what it is. You see him filtering through his deck. He's still thinking. You know he's thinking about Ancestor Recall, and I'm hoping, 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 please be Ancestor Recall. And as soon as he taps two mana, I'm like, it's not Ancestor Recall, it's Disenchant. And I, and I didn't congratulate him on the decision, but that was an excellent play. Totally perfect judgment. Yeah, I was just completely ready to trap him. And I've finally drawn white mana. Unfortunately, my hand is two red elemental blasts, but I know that because he has no cards left in, my, in his hand, if I'm able to deal with that factory and I have a huge range of things that can kill it, two strip mines left, I believe four disenchants left, as well as two divine offering and two swords of plowshares, I have a ton of things that can kill it. If I can stop that factory, those two red blasts make me feel that I have a very good chance of winning the game. I take another two damage though. I think I'm already down to seven possibly even down to five already, and I draw strip mine number three. Beautiful. Strip mine comes down. This game is looking good, Sam. Eric draws another card. And here he's just thinking. What is he thinking? Well, I think he's, um, he's, he's checking my hand, of course, or he's checking my graveyard for counter spells, thinking about what I might have. He's only got two cards in his hand. I've got a pair of tomes in the graveyard, a time walk, a couple of strip mines. And I believe one, have I played one of Red Elemental Blast? I don't think I have actually, maybe I've only drawn two. He thinks and he just says, well, it worked last game, fireball you for six. Wow. And I was at five life from the factory hits. I'm sorry that we didn't know that exactly, but sometimes you just have the goods. I'm, I'm a little bit honestly surprised that uh, he kept the fireball in the deck, given the fact that it's, 
it's rare that the fireball effect will really matter, although it is a secondary finisher if the other things have failed. And as you saw in the first game, it did allow him to win the game. So probably with the memory of that, and he certainly said it himself, the fireball was uh, decisive in game one. So he probably decided to keep it in there. And hell, you know, he top decked it within two turns after that. I was at five life. I had an answer to his factory, but I did not have a counter spell in my hand and that sealed the game up. Kudos to him, and that was the end of our semifinal match. <laughs> I mean, Eric drew and drew and drew. Yeah, he did. I think that I certainly feel if you look at the disparity of, um, you know, not to make excuses or anything, but if you look at the disparity of powerful and impactful cards drawn in both games, I think that Eric had the advantage. I think over a longer span of games, I think that um, my deck does, I feel like I do have an advantage after sideboarding. Um, not as much of an advantage as I, as I would have enjoyed when I. Uh, had the blood moons in my sideboard because blood moons would really crush his mana base as well as his as well as his factories but he drew library of alexandria in his opening draw in both games and he only had one strip mine to deal with me drawing library if i did in fact draw it and you know sometimes that's just the way it works out but it was an awesome tournament i'm super grateful to uh, daniel chang for hosting it and i'm really looking forward to playing more old school events and next time uh, i'll be playing a different version of my deck and i guarantee you it will have four mishra's factors in it i have learned my <laughs> lesson well that is so exciting and we hope to see you at gp vegas come visit us vintagemagic.com thank you everyone for supporting our channel it means a lot to me that you're enjoying the content we're putting out there i have a patreon page that supporters have access to special perks and rewards become a supporter at patreon.com vintagemagic as a patron, you receive exciting pricing on sealed product, flash sales, annual gifts, and personalized consulting services from me. Again, thank you for subscribing to our videos and supporting the channel. I love meeting players, collectors, and investors all over the world. If you see me at a Grand Prix, please come by and say hi. I would love to meet you. Thank you everyone for your support and friendship. Thank you everyone for watching the videos. I wanted to do a special thank you to Sam Tang from Kitchen Table Magic. Uh, he's been a great friend and a great artist uh, producing the videos. Been very patient with me in his directing. <laughs> and uh, um, I also wanna thank Brian Weissman. Uh, Brian and I have become uh, friends out of this and um, I've learned a lot from him. Um, and he's spent countless hours uh, sharing his knowledge and wisdom. Without you guys and the support of my Patreon, it, you know, this would never be possible. Uh, if you guys have additional comments or suggestions, I love to hear from you guys. Just go to vintagemagic.com and go to the contact us page. I would love to hear from you. So thank you so much for watching. We'll talk to you soon. Vintage Magic. Game. Collect. Invest. For more information about our consulting and professional services, visit VintageMagic.com.